Yeah, here we go for the hundred time. Hand grenade pins in every line. Throw them up and let something shine. Going out of my fucking mind. Filthy mouth, no excuse. Find a new place to hang this noose. String me up from atop these roofs. Got it tight so I won't get loose. Truth is, you can stop and stare. Run myself out and no one cares. Dug the trench out. Lay down there with a shovel up out of reach somewhere. Yeah, someone pour it in. Make it a dirt gas floor again. Say your prayers and stop it out when they bring that chorus in. I bleed it out, dig it deeper just to throw it away. I bleed it out, digging deeper just to throw it away. I bleed it out, digging deeper just to throw it away. Hey. Here we are. We're here. We even had the intro and everything for you because you're famous. Very special. You're well. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. I, curiously, I don't get mobbed when I go to the grocery store. So. I know. But uh, so that's if you if you say so. Sure. But uh, yeah, yeah. hi, Kev. Good to be here. Yeah. Good to have you, Greg. Thanks for you know because you and I have sort of chit chatted in passing in various groups uh, on and off for some time and. I I had always had this inkling that you were that Greg guy that made <laughs> hunters and all the rest of it, right? And, and so I I was like, is that that guy? And then I saw so that guy. was funny when you say, is this the guy that did the hunters? Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's me. <laughs> yeah, Derek jumps in like, don't don't you say anything mean? <laughs> you leave Greg. He's like, hey, it's okay. Well, that's and people think that I'm uh, you know trying to be pompous or something when I say Gregory M Smith, but it's because there are literally a bazillion Greg Smiths. I have yeah. to kind of set myself apart somehow. Yeah. So that's yeah. why I go with the middle initial usually. You know, besides the outrageous good looks, right? <laughs> yes, you are a handsome gentleman. But oh, look, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. So, so look, I so uh, in our little pre-show chat, we were talking about your background and everything, and I. <laughs> I, and obviously, or the deep research I've done and my, my deeper understanding of who you are as a man and uh, who you are as a, as a designer is wrong. So <laughs> I, I found out that uh, that you designed digital games uh, back in the day. So why don't we start there? And then I, mean, I guess we should say hi to the knuckleheads. But hey, everyone, there's five or six of us uh, online. Welcome. It's a designer deep dive. We've got Gregory Smith, who's got uh, a bunch of games, uh, board games under his, under his, uh, uh, what's the right word? Marquee maybe under your name, under my belt, <laughs> under your belt. That's the thing I'm looking for. And so we're going to dig in and try and understand Greg's design philosophy and all that sort of fun stuff. We're going to run this for 45 minutes to an hour, maybe longer because apparently Greg likes to talk. So we'll find out more about that. Uh, and so, but, yeah, that's my wife. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, so let's start with your a little bit about your background because I think it matters, right? Obviously, you have yeah. some real world experience in the military. Yeah, I, I have two combat tours in Iraq. Um, I retired from the army, and getting alluding to what you or getting to what you alluded to, I worked for HPS Simulations. Right. which was a computer war game company back in the uh, late 90s, right. Right. early 2000s. Um, and John Tiller and I, a lot of people, John Tiller just passed, by the way. Great guy. Uh, that's a shame, but yes. it is what it is. We're all getting older. Um, John Tiller and I did the Panzer Campaign series, and I worked on, oh, geez, I don't know, 8, 10, 12 of those with him. I didn't do all of them. Um, did the first one, Smolensk, right. you know, a whole bunch of others. I think Market Garden and uh, was probably the one I did almost totally from scratch myself. I mean, I would come up with the order of battle and the, and the hey, we need these special rules or this. It's like the uh, special rule to cover the traffic jams in Eindhoven for Market Garden, that kind of thing. Right, right. And then John would program them in, but he had his core engine built, and we cranked out all those Panzer campaigns. And they were a neat little game. I, I thought they were good for the time. Yeah. Um, and actually, my you you said, is it The Hunters your first game? Well, first paper game. Right. I actually designed a game uh, with Jim Lunsford called Defending the Reich, which was a night fighter game. And that, of course, later morphed into the paper side as a night fighter ace. But, um, you know, I went to Iraq for my second tour, uh, came back. Just my heart just wasn't into doing the computer side anymore. 
and I, you know, my heart of hearts has always been paper water games. You know, I've since the late seventies in college, you know, playing squad leader and terribly slow sword and all those games. <laughs> like, slow sword, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, Ward Europe, all that stuff, highway to the right. It was like, yeah. oh, so I always, my heart's always been with on the paper side of things. And I got back from Iraq and I said, hey, you know, uh, to HPS, I said, love you guys, but I, I need to do this paper side. So I worked on, and yeah, Hundress was my first design, and I got lucky, and it was extremely well-received, and so... I mean, it was, uh, it was a breakout solitaire game. I, yeah, I snowballed from there. Well, you know, the thing is... Um, how many how many look, units? Do you know how many units you sold of that game? Like, how many print runs did they do? Just the one or two? No, it's... It's been three? printed three times. Three times, right? So what's that? Like three, four thousand copies, five thousand. Nah, copies? six or seven, maybe. I don't know. Oh, maybe, yeah. about, maybe around six. Don't, don't sell yourself short. You're a great slouch. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, I, well, the no, thing maybe. is, the, I think the reason it was a breakout was, um, you know, we had B seventeen Queen of Skies, and that yep. was sort of the. I don't know. What do you Gold want to call candy. the grandfather, the, the yeah. genesis of the whole genre? Yeah. Uh, which is fine. And, and I love it. I've yep. played it to death. You know, I play it every year at WBC when I go. Uh, they have a tournament and all that stuff. But my main heartache and, and a couple of the guys that helped me develop the Hunters, uh, Jack Beckman, for example, one guy, um, you know, you're just along for the ride. I mean, and sure, you get choices of which guns to shoot. Well, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. Germans coming at you from the rear. I guess I'll use my tail guns. Duh. So, <laughs> yep. you know, you you're, you are literally pretty much just along for the ride. There's a few minor decisions. Right. It's a narrative generator. I look at it as a, yeah. You, you need to have but, an imagination. You, you know, know. So <laughs> I tried to I tried to build on that and add more decisions, and you get a lot more decisions. So that's. I think why the hunters was so successful. And the other thing probably was the mechanic I came up for the depth charge loop. It just gets so, t it just, every time you get depth charged and you can't get away from the escort and the tension just ratchets up and you're yep. taking more flooding and more hull damage and you're like, I need to get away. So that, that mechanic actually, I think really made the game uh, a lot of fun. So anyway, yeah. So I, uh, I was blessed by um, took the hunters to uh, Consum World Expo one year, showed it to uh, one publisher, got a ridiculous offer that was bordered on insulting. I said, forget it. And I was blessed because John Krantz saw it and he thought it was really cool. And um, it just took off from there. And so we, you know, there it is. And so since then, it's kind of snowballed. Um, and the best thing that ever happened to me, actually, I, I would say, is when John Krantz got um, laid off, that was a blessing for me <laughs> because he got laid off from his day job. And then Compass Games said, hey, we need somebody to – we're expanding. And so they hired John Krantz. And so I sort of got pulled along by the coattails, and that's why right. I sort of ended up at Compass. Right. Well, and, and so it's been, uh, you had this hiatus for a couple of years, like Hunters came out and then, I don't know, maybe you kind of, did you rest on your laurels there for a bit? Because it wasn't it 2016 was the next release that was Silent Victory, the U.S. No, it, it, it actually just took three years to, well, the thing is, is that a um, couple of reasons for that. Number one is it just took three years. No, I didn't, didn't take a rest, but John, at that time, John Krantz had a day job. Right. Uh, the artist had a day job. Right. You know, we were pushing along, and we were just sort of slowly doing it. So, yeah, Silent Victory was second game. And, yes, it took three years, from 2013 right. to 2016. Right. And that, that that used the same core engine, but it, and I had a copy, played a little bit of it, but it had a different vibe to it, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's well, of course, it takes into account all the theater differences, sure. and I'd like to think that we it's a bit, it's oh, I'm not gonna say it's a better game than The Hunters, it's right. it's it's a very ball. similar, but we did improve on a lot of things and added things like the captain cards right. and the maps and a few other things. So, we I'd like to think I up my game, you know, I like yeah. to think I'm yeah. 
I'm trying to make better games as I go. Right. Um, but it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't so much that, you know, I was just sitting around doing nothing. It's just that John Krantz and Constant Press was, it was his part-time gig and it was a mm -hmm. slow process. Once I shifted to Compass, they were like, we need you to do three or four games a year. And I'm like, Gee, yeah. No <laughs> yeah. And so this is the thing. So I'm looking at your, your catalog here and it's off the chain, right? So not just Naval, but air and uh, then, you know, funky things like Zeppelin Raider. I mean, yeah. you've got a lot of cool stuff here. So, so the core, you, you've, you're, you've got this core engine that you're able to mold and adapt. It seems to build a, build or and uh, apply it to a theme i guess so you know there's a, a world of difference between zeppelin operations uh and yes. submarine operations right so so same core engine for both systems no, uh, similar not really i'd say that i mean sort of the only really thing that's core to most of my designs solitaire wise and I had to break this mold actually for Atlantic Sentinels, the escort game. Right. I'm working on right now. But, and I do have another different engine for uh, Imperial Tide and Pacific Tide when I did right. my Pacific. That's, that's a totally different ball yeah. of wax. Yeah. But for the solitaire titles, um, essentially my approach has been okay, I want to focus on a single weapon system. And you're running that weapon system. You are. So that's how I build in the role playing elements. Okay. So that it really doesn't matter if that's a Zeppelin or a U boat or an American sub or a, a tank or an air or a bomber or whatever. A tank. Right. Uh, yeah. My tank series, by the way, is I did, just did my first tank game. It just went to the printers. It'll be four or five months probably till it gets back from China. It's literally on the slow boat from China at this point. Right. But um, uh, yeah, but you, I, you're running a single weapon system, tank, Zeppelin, submarine, aircraft, uh, interceptor ace, night fighter ace. Uh, so that core thing, okay, that's core. And you go out and you have random encounters, but between all the different that's about as far as the engine is similar to in all these games because right. of course you know tanks are not like sure. night fighters or zeppelins right. for that matter right. right and so i have to do a lot of research and and uh, i i do try i guess the um i try to pride myself in having good historical research and so that's um that's a big part of all my games and i think that's important because i mean that's you know we're all sort of amateur historians really uh i don't know unless you're being paid i'm not i mean i i guess you could say i'm a professional historian at this point uh, partially but yeah so, so there is a similar but go ahead Sorry. yeah no so i'm just curious because uh it's very rare that a game designer can build it, it, I call it an engine. That's maybe that's the wrong word, but a core set of mechanics that can be applied as well as you have applied them to a pretty, broad, a pretty broad range of not only periods but weapons, platforms, and and themes. Right. So you know, I can think of Coin, the Coin series. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got everything from uh, King Arthur to spacefaring stuff, uh, but okay, that's one, and then there's yours, and then I'm trying to think of others that, that sort of really have uh, so highly applicable. So it's pretty neat that you've done that. And, and so that's A, a compliment, and then B, a, a further question about your, about the, the original engine. When you sat down to build Hunters, what was the, you said you wanted to make it more interactive and have a higher rate or higher level of decision-making very what, key. What what did you did you look at the B seventeen in, in, engine and go well? I can use all of that, some of it, none of it, or did you just go ah? Here's how I'm going to do it, and I, I want to do subs first. So it's, what was the catalyst there? No, I, I believe it or not, I think the catalyst was I watched the movie Das Boot, Das Boot, and uh -huh. uh, yeah. it's 
So then, oh man, I had to do this. I, I just don't, at this point, I mean, you got to have mercy. It's been almost a decade. I don't yeah, yeah, yeah. remember exactly the genesis, but uh, I know I didn't, I didn't sit down and say, I want to make this, I want to make it just like B-17, but I realized that the B-17 formula of you go zone to zone to your target and then you have random encounters in each box. And I thought, well, you know, that's kind of a submarine is perfect for this. Mm -hmm. It'll be like B-17, but underwater. But because of the fact that they go out on their patrol and they run into random stuff or they don't. And you just have to adjust the probabilities. And then I'll, that's about as much as I stole, I guess, I would say, off of the B-17. Right. Right. concept because of course it's a totally different ball of wax underwater yeah, 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 yeah. um and then the rest was just a whole lot of historical research into uh you know the hundreds of targets that are in the game and and what have you but um i think you know when i had the if i were to go back and do the hunters i i would probably put more to i mean i get beat up on there's not enough decisions in your games, blah, blah. I get beat up on that all the time, sure. which is, uh, uh, okay, I, I accept the criticism. Some people have different levels of acceptable decision-making than right. other people. Right. Right. I think there's plenty of decisions. You got to decide whether to attack to begin with. Uh, right. Are the right. conditions right? Is it night? Is it day? Should you follow the guy? What range? What risk are you willing to accept? But um, really my... Um, design focus has always been try to give as many meaningful decisions to the player as you can. Right. right. Anytime you can add a decision to a solitaire game, it's a win. Yeah. So that's that's kind of has been my philosophy. And uh, another philosophy is if it works, keep it, or if it applies, um, use it. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with using it. For example, defending America is the sequel to America Bomber <laughs> I did. Um, America Bomber, Evil Queen of the Skies, by the way, a good example. Now that is pretty much stolen from B-17, but it's the reverse. You're the evil Nazis and you're evil bomber there. Yeah. Um, so America, Defending America is the sequel to that. And I that's why I developed this uh, uh, flight school so I used to just say, oh, you've, you're graduated from whatever school, and so here's an experience point. Start the game. And then I said, oh, you know what? Why not make the player do flight school? So I developed this flight school. That's what starts the game, and you also have a decision in flight school. So works great. I thought this is awesome. So guess what? My next game when I worked on America Tank Ace, I put in tank school. Which I attended at Fort Knox, by the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know the real one. So uh, I said, "Yeah, hey, you know." So if it works, put it in. If it doesn't work or doesn't apply to the new situation, I don't put it in. So that's that's been helpful. Um, it is an amazingly flexible core engine. I will mm -hmm. grant you that. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I um, and I try to credit people, like you know, people who have given me great ideas. Um, I had a, a bar fight in the, in the, one of the schools <laughs> and, uh, uh, who was it? Uh, that crazy Canadian, um, who does the show, uh, no enemies here. Um, Oh yeah. Yeah. Danny uh, DeVito. <laughs> <laughs> I'm drawing a blank. I'm sorry. He's going to be mad at me for forgetting his name. Anyway, it's, uh, uh, of course I can't remember what I had for breakfast. It's, so it's, uh, but he came up with the idea is, Hey, the bar fight could go either way. You could win or lose. So I thought, Oh, that's a good idea. Anyway, the point is it, if it fits, put it in. If it's, if you can modify it for another game and it's really cool and it works in this new game, do it. You know, there's, right. there's nothing wrong with that. Right. Right. So, um, yeah, I'm, I've been really happy. I, I don't want people to think I'm a, like a one trick pony, I guess, which is why I, I have my two player games of a totally different engine. Um, 
Yeah, and I've seen I've seen your uh, I've, I've seen your actually the tank game has a pretty much different engine. Well, mostly, but Does go ahead. You're going to say no, you've seen I was going to say about your Pacific game. I, I've seen it played, but I had not played it, and folks were having fun with it. So uh, yeah, it's neat. Yeah, it's no, the two card, player, two player. Yeah, the the decision making is through the roof because it's two player and it's card driven, and you've got a sequencing matters, and you got to play this card before that. Anyway, yeah. Well, so let's uh, let's switch gears and let's have um, let's have a chat about subs in Japanese subs in particular. And uh, I know you've sent me some materials that we can share up on screen. But I thought I thought what might be cool is uh, just to sort of start walking through the uh, the idea for this first of all, which is probably pretty. I'm going to guess might be relatively straightforward, but. I'm going to let you explain why, why you came up with this title and tell us a little bit more about it. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I did the hunters, I did silent victory, which is American subs in the Pacific and probably I've gotten half a dozen. I get a lot of requests from fans. Yeah. Yeah. You know, please do this game or this weapon system is my favorite please do a game featuring, you know, whatever. And so I got a lot of requests for the Japanese side. <clears throat> and this is probably five, six years ago. So I, um, I looked into it and I was like, wow, they had some crazy subs. Um, but they had doctrinal issues. Mm -hmm. If you look at the fact that they had this huge submarine fleet, much larger than ours at the start of World War II, and yet they – they sort of underachieved, I guess, is a good way to say it. Um, and why was that? I mean, because they had submarines with midget subs strapped to the top and aircraft in watertight hangars. It's just insane. And you're thinking, wow. They, I mean, they had technologically, they were there and they had all kinds of, they had like, I have 17 classes of sub in the game. So what was the problem? Well, so I looked at all that and I thought, yeah, I could do this, but I don't know how to handicap. I've got a hamstring, you know, and I hate to do that, you know, but I've got to place some historical constraints on the players so they don't rack up, you know, 300,000 tons like they're a right, U-boat or right, something right, right. running around loose in the Pacific uh, doing things that were never done. And, and why were they so um, underperforming? Well, so the project kind of languished for a while because I was trying to roll through this. How do I represent that in my head? Because it wasn't as clean as the American, you know, as Silent Victory, which is, you know, because the American subs did what a submarine force ought to do, which is strangle the enemy shipping and put it, especially against Japan, an island nation, you know, brilliant, you know, sort of <clears throat> similar to U-boats in Britain. Um so the project kind of languished, and then a fellow countryman of yours, um, Brett Grimmond, I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's a, he's a fan of mine from Australia. He uh, lives in New South Wales somewhere, I think. And he was like, oh, mate, you, you got to do the Japanese side. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, I mean, he yeah, persistence pays. <laughs> he started bombarding me with all these materials and – and the midget subs and the Kai-10 suicide torpedoes and, and the uh, wow. the float planes. And I was like, okay, all right. So, so Brett kind of shamed me into starting the project. And then I had this epiphany, and I finally cracked the code on how to represent the doctrinal issues. And so the way I approached that in the game, I was thought, oh, okay, what I can do is I have all these historical major event markers in the game. So I'll grab just a handful of them. Here's my prototype game. I got like a bazillion of them. Uh, here, I'll just, I'll read a couple. I'll put on my glasses and then read a couple. <laughs> <laughs> I would probably okay, have to so, the same thing. Yeah. Mariana's 1144 to 445. And on the back, Kai 10. Panama Canal, Indian Ocean, which is midget. Uh, USS West, US West Coast, shore bombardment. Guadalcanal, midget 
picket duty, transport. So there's different, there's a decrement list of special missions. So each major event, and they're all historical, New Guinea, Australia, Marianas, Guadalcanal, I think I read that one, Indian Ocean. So what you do is at the start of each month, you put out these major event markers as they historically are. Yeah, you place them on the map. So if the midway is active, you put the midway counter on the midway box. And if you get assigned a midway on the charts to patrol at midway, if your submarine is capable of performing a special mission that's listed on the back of the counter, then, then you have to do that. So th that's the historical breaks on your activity. Right. And it ties into what's actually happening in the war. So for example, if you start the game in, you know, Pearl Harbor in, in uh, some, uh, 1241, you started December 41. If you have a midget capable, a midget submarine capable carrying sub, you're very likely to get assigned. If you're assigned to Pearl Harbor, area then you're going to be assigned to do a midget mission that will be your mission um if you have aircraft if you have an aircraft uh capable submarine and you're assigned to to the pearl harbor you're not going to be doing a midget mission because you're not capable of doing a midget mission right, right, right. But if you have an aircraft uh, a float plane submarine and you're assigned to the west coast you might be assigned to bomb oregon so there's a decrement list that matches you cross-reference that to what your submarine is actually capable of doing. And uh, so that gives you the sort of the historical, and there's 10 different missions, reconnaissance, transport, uh, evacuation, uh, bombing, as I said, uh, uh, midget, midget missions against harbors. So it's kind of neat. It ties all the history in to the doctrine and it ties it into what actually happened in the war and so that's what sort of puts the doctrinal breaks on your capabilities um, right. so you're not just running around doing what you want to do right so it's that helps you, uh, helps you not get into that uh, outrageous uh, racking up of tonnage that can sometimes yeah. happen right right yeah yeah it's not close to so uh, i thought we tested that out and i thought oh this is working great so i'm very happy with how that worked out you know, finally, and once I did that, then it was just, you know, off to the races, designing all the subs and the charts and the, got a lot of help from Brett Grimmin. The other thing that were, this game is way different than Silent Victory, for example, which is its direct counterpart, you might argue, mm -hmm. um, is the game has three, no, no pun intended, three sub modules. Uh, there's the aircraft module. The Kai-10 module, the suicide torpedoes, those don't show up till later, like 44. And the um, aircraft and the midget midget module. So when you launch a midget attack, you actually break off into a separate module of the game, and you're uh, running your you're running your little midget submarine through the harbor defenses, and uh, we have maps and everything for all that. Interesting. So there's sub games, yeah. Let's yeah. Look. So there's, there's no, again, no pun intended. There's three of these major sub modules, okay. and the aircraft one's kind of cool too because you either you're going either bombing or you're running in doing a reconnaissance of a harbor right. or an area, and uh, you might get shot at, and you get to train your pilots. Um, well, let's. So before we do too much more on the sub modules, let's have a look at because it's because one of the things that I I sort of disconnected with with hunters was that you didn't get to you got awards and things but there really wasn't sort of that role playing aspect and i think you've kind of built more into this module and some other modules as oh, well yeah, the, sure. the, the role playing so let's let's share uh why is it not showing because uh, i need to change the, right here we go Let's do this. Right. So let's talk a little bit about, tell us a little bit more about A, the catalyst for having this and B, how can I tell us how this works? And hopefully that's visible to most of the folks. It's a little, little small, pardon my. Uh... Yeah. The, uh, well, the dress up doll, as we like to call it. Right. Right. Uh, man, I can't remember when I had the first one. 
It was for Night Fighter Ace, actually, an aircraft game. <laughs> um, and so part of this decision, part of the decision-making process, at least in uh, Sensuicon here, as it was, I've had this for a while, but basically what I try to do is I have to try to have skills. Right. And you could purchase... Yeah, the uh, the uh, the kanji on the original uh, artwork was uh, incorrect. It said something like "I hate waffles" or something. John, <laughs> yeah. that's funny. The artist has since fixed that. But anyway, the the uh, the point is, uh, so you do win the award. The awards are mainly for role playing fun. You know, I mean, who doesn't want to win the Order of the Sacred Treasure? You know, or the of course. Order of the Golden Kite, fourth class. I mean, you know, that's that's just sort of fun. But the skills are actually a huge part of the game. As far as the, the captain has leadership skill, torpedo gunnery. Uh, Shibumi is a sort of a, which roughly translates as effortless perfection. But that's, that's uh, sort of like a good luck charm. Um, but your XO could become a uh, deck gun expert. He can become uh, vigilant, which helps him uh, spot aircraft easier. Your engineer be can have keen judgment, become a mechanical genius, uh, blah, blah, blah. So and all your guys can become. So you have to decide uh, which skills you want to get first, which has an impact on your survival to one degree and your performance mm -hmm. on another degree. Right. So, uh, you know, the, the other thing is we – as you can see, that's not just the skills for the captain, but for the midget submarine commander can have skills on the left there. Your air crew yeah. can have skills. Uh, if you scroll it down, you can see that there's skills for the rest. No, lower. Yeah, skills for your other crew members. XO and uh, engineers, yep. Your major crew members, anyway. Yeah. So uh, – there's a lot of cool skills to buy and you just have to decide which ones you want first and uh, rank and awards all have different. Some of the awards have uh, give you some capabilities, but they're really minor in game terms. Mainly that's just for, for giggles, I guess is sure. <laughs> a better way to put it, yeah. uh, but it's cool. You know, I, I like, I like having the historical awards and, and these are so bizarre. Well, not bizarre, but, you know, you all the rest of my games like Iron Cross. Yeah, yeah, okay. Most of the games have Iron Cross or the Purple Heart. Or, and you know, and I, find, I find it uh, ironic that it's the golden kite for a submarine commander, right? So, uh, yeah, well, <laughs> right. Uh, the or, Order of the Rising Sun, I think, makes sense. But yeah, yeah, well, that's just that's the way they were. Yeah. Um, so I think that's pretty cool. That's uh, that's an and that's a, an interesting additional layer that helps immerse yeah. the player. And of course, and by the way, these are all prototype. Sure. Yeah, we you know, materials that. For anybody watching, you know, it's uh, the final one isn't going to look like that. It's going to look a lot better, I would assume. They normally do. Compass has blessed me with just awesome artists. Yeah. Now, you, you've used Ilya several times, right? He's, he's an amazing artist. Yes. Yes. And, um, well, and, you know, I've had, I don't know, geez, seven, eight different artists over the years, right. at least. Ian Wedge is good. I've, my current guy I'm having a, a, a man crush on is uh, Nadir Elfara. He's, he's, Nadir Elfara is going to be the artist for this game, by the way. Okay. He did the cover. Um, and he's, uh, he's, he does great work, too. I mean, just no complaints. Bruce Yarian's worked on some. I had my, Matt White for the tank game a long time. Yeah, here. yeah, Matt's got what a great artist, huh? Yeah, so I have no no complaints on the art side. I have been blessed by work being able to work with Compass. They just give me great people to work with. So I have no no issues there. I'm happy camping. Yeah, so this is a picture of the submarine school, which is again that thing I was telling you about. It mm -hmm. started off in, a, in another game. I had tanks. I've had tank school and flight school, and I was like, well. Let's send the guy to submarine school. And, uh, you know, the top is you just sort of roll. You, you either get a minor game benefit or you don't. 
the bottom part is how you spend your spare time. And that's where you have to make the choice whether you want to um, uh, get a good luck marker or you get a uh, minus two to your next promotion and a free sub marker. And I forget what the martial arts training gives you a shibumi. Um, so it is. Um, yeah, that's pretty cool. cool right? playing and it kind of helped out and it, yeah. was kinda, it was kind of a neat way to start the game, I thought. Yeah, it gets you, it gets you thematically engaged, right? I like exactly. the, all, the, all the Japanese uh, on the side there. Let's uh, now, so the ship, the, the, Target, these are obviously targets. Uh, oh no, no, this is your. No, well, this is, your this is what yeah. you're rolling. This is yeah. what you're rolling around in. Yeah. Uh, type C class. Well, you can see the midget on the back of the deck there yeah. on the left side upper. Uh, this is just a prototype. Anybody who's played any of my other submarine games, they'll find them to be very uh, similar. Um, oh, I think they sent you. Did you did you put the? Do you have the other sub I sent you? No, I think so. Uh, you want to see that one? Let me see. Yeah, that I want to see that one. Oh yeah, this guy. Yeah, this guy. Is it? What well, this? This is kind of interesting because it shows um, the Kai Ten. So this was this class had an aircraft. It has a Yokosaka E14, I think Y1. You see the the uh, well, yeah. So it actually starts with an aircraft and a deck gun. But then if you, the reason they're in color, because then later on in the war, scroll down a bit. Once you install, if uh, Kai-10 get installed, then yeah, they'll yeah. go away. Yeah. yeah, so if you get your six suicide torpedoes on the deck, you don't have room for the, for the aircraft anymore or the deck gun. So you take those off and you put the Kai-10 suicide torpedoes in and off you go. But uh, there's 17 different classes of submarine. <laughs> so we got, there's, there's a lot. Uh, I think, and, that's, and that's pretty interesting because I, I guess my, my perception uh, of, and, I, and I'm not a huge Pacific theater guy. Not, sure. guy. I don't know. I've read uh, all of Hornfisher and Toll. So I, I get it from that kind of a, I guess that's a 30,000 foot uh, mm -hmm. view and understand sort of what went on and the the difficulties and all the rest of it. But you don't really appreciate the, the huge variability in platforms, right? Oh, yeah. It's yeah, insane. so it's off the chain. This is, I mean, this. The, well, that, I mean, uh, yeah, they had uh, like their Johnson and their Kaidai classes were all basically sort of like our Gato. You would consider them sort of a, your standard submarine. But then they had all these crazy guys like this B3 with the right. aircraft and a watertight hangar. And then they had the C-class with the midget strapped on the back. And then they had a bunch of other uh, aircraft capable uh, submarines as well. So, and I like to, you know, I figured players are going to want to play with, it, it asks for more variability. I think more the war games that where you play it once and well, I've done it, so I'm done. Right. Right. You know, that's right. kind of substandard. So I want to have max variability, max replayability. And that's why I have all the, well, plus it's historical, you know, why not? Yeah. I, I oh. can fit them in. So let's put them in. So I got 17 different classes of submarine, <laughs> basically just, all the major fleet boat, uh, fleet ocean boat, right. ocean going fleet boats. And I look at the, uh, what's interesting, because uh, I was just reading an article about the Australian Navy and how they're, switching from manufacturing they were going to manufacture with the french the one of the the french versions of one of their nuclear subs and then they're going to go with the yanks subs but uh the french version of the sub was a five i think it was a five thousand ton displacement but a crew of 65 and here we have a, a sub half the size with a double double the crew right yeah and these are well, diesel these are all diesel right so yes the miracle the miracle of technology that's uh, yeah. Yeah. less people when you have a lot more sophisticated machines so that doesn't surprise me but yeah these they they had pretty big crews most of them were uh most of them were 70 plus that i can remember type a 114 uh the japanese they're really big boats for the most part right um Anyway, but it's uh, it's 
again, core engine. It's like the Hunters. It's like Silent Victory, but wow, it's not. I mean, there's mm -hmm. the three different modules to account for the aircraft and the midgets and the, yeah. <laughs> Someone commented, we were one of the testers. It's like, you know, for a sub game, there sure are a lot of airplanes in this thing. Right, right. Uh, so, so let's talk about the air. You said there was an air sub game as well, right? So do you want to talk a right. little bit about that? So let's talk about that and uh, and maybe help, help us understand what's going on here as well, because this is this looks interesting. Well, um, there's um, you could actually have encounter uh, American aircraft, uh, so you don't want to get so there is uh, and you could take damage from either them or from flak. Yeah, well, flak. That's an uh, anti aircraft. I guess I yeah. shouldn't call it flak. <laughs> I've done too many German games. It's always, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's always flack to me. I'm sorry. Anti-aircraft. Uh, but basically, though, the recovery chart, so you launch this thing, and hopefully it could come back. So if your radio <laughs> breaks, you, you might not find the mother sub again. Uh, so you don't want your radio to get uh, shot out. But um, basically, there's... You could be, depending on the mission, you might actually have a mission to bomb Oregon, for example. Uh, towards the end of the game, there's actually a mission to bomb the Panama Canal, <laughs> which uh, I could resist putting that in. Uh, right. They actually were planning to do that, believe it or not, but they scrapped it as kind of impractical because they couldn't really get it rolling. Um, they had the sub capable of doing it. I think the first one came out in '44 early 45, something like that. Got a question here for you on uh, sure. research. You know, I, uh, here, this is my downstairs research library, moving the camera. Oh, well, let me, uh, let me just pop you back up on screen. Hang on one sec. Yeah. Where, uh, there we go. Yeah, this is the downstairs research library. Uh, I have an upstairs library as well. So yes, I have I have a pretty massive library. Long story, when I was in the military, they kind of encouraged us uh, right. to read. But I do also um, um, get help from online from different uh, contributors. Uh, great example for Silent Victory. I was trying to figure out what the torpedo load was for the um, Tench class. <clears throat> and some reports said 24, just like the Bilal and the Gato class. And some people said 28. And I was like, 28? how they do that? And so uh, Commander Paul O'Grady of the Royal Australian Navy, no less, was at the uh, – I have a lot of Australian friends. I don't know what's, what's up with that. <laughs> they're <laughs> everywhere. They're, 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 like, uh, they're like cockroaches. They're everywhere. Yeah, everywhere, man. Well, this guy was a, this guy was a Hunter's fan. He was going to the uh, War College, and he went to their library and researched and found out that, believe it or not, the engineers – rerouted a bunch of pipes and did a bunch of modifications in the tench class, they were able to fit four more torpedoes in that sucker. So yeah, that's why it had 28. So I get outside help at times. Uh, for example, Brett Grimmond, he's a huge fan of this particular topic. He's the co-designer uh, because he did a lot of the work on the modules. So Brett, Brett did a lot of research and dug up a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, obviously with the miracle of Wikipedia, I mean, a lot, I do get a lot of, of research right off the internet, uh, but I have a pretty massive library as well. And I'm not, I'm not adverse to pumping out a hundred bucks to get a, you know, if I need a, a, a book on Japanese submarines, I, I'll buy it. I mean, I, probably bought three, $400 worth of books just for this game. I mean, I've got a uh, sunk uh, one on I-Boat I -boat Captain, <clears throat> the first team, the Pacific War. Anyway, the, the point is, yes, uh, a little bit of above, a little bit of all that. I wouldn't say I have the largest library, but I have a decent submarine library to say the right, least. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not exactly a broadly – I imagine it's not a royally covered topic either. So, yeah. well, there's there's a decent amount. The, the thing is, you you just have to dig. You have to use mm -hmm. everything. 
you have to you have to go online you have to check with people who are knowledgeable and you also need to or get books there's even though this is the digital age guess what sometimes books are totally just invaluable to give you that one little piece of information you need to make the game right i i i really feel strongly about the research you know uh because otherwise we're just playing axis and ally specific you know <laughs> what? <laughs> what? right so right the research in there it's important and i i don't know that's just me i'm a history nut so i yeah. i'd like to do that but uh, well i think we're all a little bit of a history nut aren't we right where that's why we do this yeah and, uh, valid point sir so anyway, I'm I'm excited for this title. I, I, uh, I the artist is still finishing up Western Front Ace. That's my World War One um, airplane game. Right. Probably my magnum opus, you might say. <laughs> really? So so why? So now why is that? Because easily could have made three games out of it, probably. Mm. It's there's seven nationalities covered. Um, wow. Okay. On the Western Front of World War One, it's the second half of the war, seven, 1917, 1918. Actually, a little, little bit of 1916. Um, there's 60 aircraft to choose from. 60, six zero. <laughs> Wow. Just the component. This is going to be the biggest box game I've ever. You know, it's it's massive. It's huge. Uh, the artwork has been, I've had three artists working on this one game, three. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's my magnum opus to say the least. Uh, well, we'll have to get you back on once you've got some, uh, some content that we can have a look at and let's, uh, let's talk about that as well. I'd love to. Sounds sure. awesome. Sure. It's, uh, it's actually getting close to done. So the artist for this game, Sensuicon Nadir, is helping me wrap up Western Front Ace. It's actually quite a bit further along. I'd be happy to come on again and, and show you some. Yeah, uh, yeah I have some final, final materials. Uh, it's gorgeous. The, the the cover's gorgeous. The the aircraft mats are gorgeous. The artist. The, the funny thing is, on Western Front Ace. Um, well, anyway, the artist is helping me finish Western Front Ace, and then he's going to help me do Sensuicon here. But uh, the, it's funny because the artist for Western Front Ace, Ian Wedge, he's the one that did the Hunters and Silent Victory for me. So uh -huh. he and I go back 10 years, right? So Ian, I'm like, hey, I'm doing this World War One airplane game. He goes, I'm doing it. <laughs> I'm your man. I'm like, why? He goes, he goes, well, I just do submarines. I said, but I, my true heart, I'm a World War One airplane nut. I'm like, oh, is that so? And uh, he is. It's been uh, it's been insane because, like, normally, the artist doesn't know jack about right. the game topic. He just he just, oh, you want a tank? Here's your tank. Oh, you want an airplane? You know, a sub? Here it is. I mean, Ian like corrects me on every little tiny historical detail. So if I get some little tiny historical detail, he's like. No, no, no. In 1917, this was, you know, there's three rivets here, not just two. Oh, I mean, it's been like, whoa. So it's really been kind of cool to have an artist who uh, who knows is pretty much more about the topic than I do as designer. And I, I'm not like a slouch on, on it. Anyway, did I miss a question or something? Or? No, no, you're good. I just uh, popped me up that we just, uh, someone was singing your praises. Oh, Okay. I'm, I'm trying to keep you humble, man. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Charles. I appreciate it. Um, so. But uh, yeah, so it's been really. Oh, and the other thing is the co-designer for Western Front Ace uh, is another World War One nut, and he's like, you know, knows how many rivets were in the tail and what, whatever. It's it's insane. So uh, between those two guys, they. Trust me, the historical research for Western Front Ace is deep and right. It's yeah, better than any game I've ever done, without question. It's it's funny to have the artist, you know, straighten you out. It's like, no, buddy, this needs to be this yeah, way. Yeah, that doesn't happen very often, does it? No, so that's good. It's been kind of fun learning experience for me too, but um, it, it's all good. Uh, but I'm I'm excited for this one. I think this is going to be a really a really good one. It's it's unique with these 
uh, major historical events with the mm. decrement list of missions on the back. And I like that idea. Yeah. Yeah, it's a neat and it's that's a new mechanic, but I had to come up with it because you know I had to. How do I represent this doctrinal handicap? Because the Japanese did not view the submarine force as you know a force to go destroy mm. the enemy shipping. Right. Not in the least. Right. Which is what they really should be doing. The Japanese viewed them as an adjunct force to the main fleet. It was all about the, you know, Kido Batata. So almost like a screening force and a. Well, a, yeah, a, a lot picket, of times. A picket type of uh, force. At one, and one. of course, that's. I have that mission for, for Midway. You're on picket duty. You can be assigned to picket duty. Of course, everybody knows the historical issue with that is the Japanese submarines went out to picket in front of Midway, but the Americans were already passed. Yes. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. yeah. You know, the, the bar, the, 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 uh, the horse is already out the barn door when right. they went up to close it. Right. So, yeah, but definitely it's an adjunct force. It's going to support the, the main fleet. And so many of their missions, that's what they did. Of course, later in the war, when they're getting their asses kicked, and they had desperation missions like evacuation of uh, the act. You might be assigned to evacuate the Aleutians, uh, supply missions to Guadalcanal. There's there's that kind of thing going on in the game as well. But it's all covered historically. I I think that this new mechanic was is pretty good. So, you know, I had to had to come up with something. And once I broke that code, it made the rest of the game possible. And of course, Brett Grimmond did yeoman work on the modules. And uh, he kind of opened my eyes to the whole world of Kaiten suicide torpedoes, <laughs> which which were actually it was sad, it, really a sad chapter that that they would do that. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's essentially torpedo version of kamikazes. Right, right, right. Yeah. From an aircraft, it's a torpedo. So they'd strap this poor schmuck on this torpedo. It, it was modified a little bit. They had to manufacture them, had some steering controls, but they Apparently they were hard as hell to steer, which of course it's going freaking thirty-five knots or whatever. Doesn't doesn't surprise me. It would be hard to steer. Uh, they actually sank like I don't know five or six ships. They had a few successes with them, but I mean, out of a hundred, I mean, the effort to reward ratio is horrible. Uh, uh, yeah, and you know that's the thing that kind of bug that in general that bugs me about uh, the Pacific theater. When we, it, so I started doing some research and reading on uh, air to sea and air to air combat during the Pacific War, right? Pacific theater, uh -huh. World War Two, and looking at how the games that I have model the air, air to ship conflicts and the air to air conflicts, excluding all the land stuff, right? So okay. we have so few sorties or engagements to build a statistical model of, right? Uh, like if you're trying to, every game I've had, a, I've dabbled in War on the Pacific and uh, what's the other big one I've got? Uh, even the Pacific War from Herman, you know, you're the results never turn out even close to what say happened at Midway when, someone goes to hit some ship, right? And you, you take the exact uh, loadout and, and kit and you do the, the exact same things. You don't even get within a, you know, yeah. country I mile of, of, of the results. So, so it's funny that, um, you know, you look at, you look at those systems, look at the, how designers are building their results. They're building them off a pretty sparse set of data, right? So you've got, you, and then cycling it back to what you were talking about with the with the suicide torpedo guys, the Kaiten, you've got only five, six, five or six successes out of the hundreds or thousands that were made. I don't know how many. Well, about a little over 100, actually. A little over 100. So 5% success rate, and I don't know how many were launched. So, you know, that's pretty crappy. You know, to work, make that work in the game and make it interesting, right? Well, that's, yeah. It's, uh, it's curious. We actually took that into account. Um, your 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 Kai Ten are gonna. Well, here's the attack on Ulithi with Kai Ten. Um, 
you're you're not going to have very good success with them. I've I've taken that into account. Yeah, yeah, I try yeah. to be statistically in the ballpark. I mean, but yeah. it's their games. We're rolling dice. Sure. You know, sure. your results may vary as they yeah, say. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So you do yeah. have that, but but you bring up a very valid point, which is the core. If the if the core engine or mechanics system is designed correctly over the long haul you're going to get essentially the right, right results I'll, I'll give you a great example for the hunters i took a prototype version of the hunters to consum world expo in phoenix back in 20 i want to say 2011 2012 before it was published this is i made six prototypes ran a tournament taught everybody people come up to play and they it was a hit because people could play you know a 10 minute mission right. in between their turns of their monster game right. so they were doing this yeah. to to kill their dead time right yeah so i got 70 people to play 70 and this is when i knew that i was on track with with the my engine because the top 10 scores of the tournament which ran all week long almost almost identically mirrored the top 10 german u-boat commanders in the first half of the war i should you not oh, interesting pardon my language but i kid you not it almost perfectly mirrored their scores in tonnage and i said to myself i am on track here so yeah. but yeah but see so yeah i you're not gonna be really you're not going to be knocking the American fleet to the bottom of the ocean with your kite. Right, right, right. You're not taking out <laughs> you the might, ocean. you yeah. might have one or two successes with right. them, but the the probabilities are set up to match. I mean, and there's on the kite ten chart, there's like you actually have to roll on the premature detonation, <laughs> 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 which was which was an issue, you know. It's yeah, yeah. Issue for some uh, for some younger men as well. <laughs> but That's what I've heard. But uh, yeah, so some of them they blew up before they even got, and then you got to get over the torpedo nets, and got to get past the coral reef, and, and then you got to steer them in. And so yeah, there's a if if you actually sink something or even a couple ships, you're doing really well with the Kai Ten. I mean, but it's it's uh they're fun, they're neat. It's just right. a neat yeah. historical. Yeah. I, I don't think a lot of people realize that they even existed. That it's the no. torpedo no. version of the Kamikaze aircraft. Yeah, I, I think I'd heard of them, but I'd never really. Yeah, heard well, of them. I I had never really heard of them, and then Brett Grimman said, "Hey, mate, you." <laughs> now I know more about them than I probably <laughs> want to know. And uh, yeah, so it was, it was kind of, it's a neat addition to the game. I think it's great. Um, and I think this game, because of the three sub modules and, and uh, I have more, let's face it. I've been doing, I've been doing this for 10 years now. So I've learned a couple things <laughs> over the years. I think this is going to be one of the better submarine games, without question. Just because right, and it's, it sounds like it's going to have more uh, extensive options for repeat play, right? So you've got a, a, a bigger base oh. of units to try out. You've got the three sub modules. You can build up a number of captains and see how they do. And one of the things, there's that a, I like, yeah, there's a lot of options, a lot of different. Yeah. I mean, you can go for a midget sub career, or you could go for just a standard submarine like the Kai Dai class or the uh, right. Johnson. Um, or you can go for one of these guys that carries the airplanes and go for that kind of career. So there's a lot of variability, a lot of replayability, uh, reasonably historical results. I mean, again, your your mileage may vary depending yeah, on those yeah, guys. But uh, and you could do all kinds of different crazy things like, you know, and maybe at the end of the war, you can finish off your game with a bang by bombing the Panama Canal. Right, uh, right. <laughs> but yeah, I think it's it's I think it's a, a proven, a proven game system, but it's a, a new topic and it's got a lot of new wrinkles to it. And I think it's going to be cool. So well, cool. And, and I think I've seen, you know, one of the things that I've liked when I did play hunters and I had it here at the house was that I could, it doesn't take up a lot of space so I can yeah. 
set it up on a corner of the table. I can literally, so I, I work downstairs in our office, but I also have my sure. game room just down the hallway. And I, as I walk out, I found I could stop, look at look at the map and go, okay, I'm gonna do this and I can roll the dice and leave it, you, you know, move, move well, the table, resolve something and it's two, two or three minutes and it's a phase, I've done it, and then I can walk out and come back and continue on later. I, and I think that's definitely part of the uh, appeal of my solitaire games is that most of them are, you can run one patrol, one mission, one anything. Right. Takes you 10 or 15 minutes and then yeah. you leave it till tomorrow. Yeah. You know, because the kids are bugging you or whatever. And right. Here's a question for you. So did you ever think of doing a campaign game about the bombing raids on the trippets? That's interesting. Actually, you know who really ought to do that game is Jeremy White, who did um, um, no, but you know what game I did think about doing along these lines was I wanted to do a game on the channel dash. Mm, okay. I thought that would be kind of cool. Uh, Jeremy White, who did the uh, Dam Busters and yeah. This would be so perfect for him to do. And I have a half a dozen games I'm working on right now. So, uh, you know, the, let's, let's start a grassroots campaign and, uh, and uh, draft Jeremy White to do that game. I could. I mean, I suppose I could do it. It would be neat. Uh, it took him a while. I, I forget they finally sank it after three or four attempts with uh, – Tall boy. I mean, didn't they drop those big honking twenty-two thousand pound bombs on them? Yeah, I don't know. That's not a. That's not I, a I, I I don't know all the history on that either. But yeah, that would be. I mean, I'm not saying it wouldn't be a cool game. I'm not sure right. if I'm the perfect guy to do it. I think Jeremy White would be the perfect guy to do that game, and maybe he's already working on it. I don't know. I mean, yeah. I, I uh, Jeremy what? White, by the way, is a. I don't know if you know him. I, you've heard the name, uh, Kev, mm -hmm. I suppose. Yeah. You know the Doolittle Raid and the Dam Busters, and he has yeah. a lot of solitaire type. He won my oh, he just did Atlanta Chase. I mean, so the yeah. guy's like, yeah, freaking genius to yeah. start with. Which is, and brilliant. one, I guess you could say he's like my main competitor, I suppose, <laughs> as a designer. But the thing about Jerry, I met him. He's a great. Uh, he's just an awesome guy. The great story. This this will clue you in on why Jeremy White is like three levels above me. Um, so I'm at Constant World Expo and I'm showing off Western Front Ace, my World War I giant, you know, eight countries or seven countries and 60 airplanes game. And I showed it to Stuka Joe who was there that year. And Stuka yeah. Joe was like, he did his video on it and everybody was, that's kind of got the ball rolling. Jeremy White comes up, he fiddles with it for five minutes and he goes, oh, you need to do this, advanced maneuvers, one, two, three, and add that to the game, and then I'll make it like, I'm like, this, <laughs> game, this guy, like, looks at my game for five minutes and improves it, like, twice as good. It, I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is now this game is going to be so much better oh, just wow. because he just took a look at it and five minutes later said, oh, here, fix your game. Yeah, why don't you do this? Isn't that oh, interesting? Oh, yeah. The guy, the guy is, I, I, next time I see Jeremy White, I'm just going to do the old, you know, Wayne's World, I'm not worthy. Because he, yeah, he, cool. he is truly a, a, a talent. And uh, and I think he would be the right guy to do the Turpus game. That's why I bring it up. He could probably right. do it. Just right, right. right. Oh, boy, there we go. On the third raid, they finally got it. Yeah. Yeah, the twenty-two thousand pound bombs. Yeah. So I had always, uh, I, I was, I've always been interested in a tactical game that would uh, allow you to take the role in uh, sort of pre World War One, pre maybe even uh, pre Napoleonic, but you could certainly do it in the Napoleonic era, uh, and have some sort of like a skirmish patrol type of game where you, you know, you send out. They weren't. Uh, uh, they were not squads, obviously, because the Romans didn't call them squads, but it was a, a 
couple of hundred, a hundred, hundred guys or less, like a century or part of the yeah, century. Yeah. And so they go out foraging or they would go out and they're, they're re doing recon and all that sort of stuff. And for some reason, the word, man, for some reason, the word manipul. Manipul is what I was thinking, but I thought that might be too many guys. But uh, so I, I, I was manipul is like their squad, like 10 guys. Okay. So, a man, so imagine, you know, taking a manipul out with a centurion and then you're, you're off, you're either doing a foraging mission or you're doing a recon mission or you're, uh, you know, some sort of, I guess they call it scouting then, but you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. For like that. Uh, so, or maybe it's a cavalry unit that's off doing that type of thing. And what sort of engagements would they get into? Cause you don't really get any of that sort of ancient combat experience other than, you know, two two big ass lines of guys run at each other and bash shields for forty five minutes, and then yeah, oh, I, I have yeah. ancients always. I wasn't one, always. one side runs away. Now I love ancients and I'm, I'm into it, but uh, the it would be interesting to play a game like that, right? That well, I actually am working that. on my first ancients title. I guess you might call it that. Um, okay, I'm going to do a game on. Um, gladiators no way all right that's pretty cool so uh it's gonna be sort of my role but basically you're the lanista so you're in charge of the uh, um the the training school did you ever see did you ever see um the tv show on uh spartacus with, uh, yeah the, I saw yeah, the, the R-rated one where they have yeah. lots. There's lots of sex and boobs and. Yeah, yeah. Saw some of it. Yes. Yeah, so I thought you know this would be cool if you could run the Lanista, or you could run the Ludus. You're the Lanista. You have X amount of denarii to spend, and you know you could buy a a, a crappy medicus or the doctor, right? Or right. a or an average one or a good one, or you could spend your money on on better food for your dudes. You're going to have your doctori, which is the trainer, the head mm -hmm. trainer guy. And then you're, you're um, basically the combat is going to be like down in flames. I don't know if you've ever played that. Don't think I have, no. Okay. So basically you, you're, you're two gladiators. Uh, let me get my hands up. You're two gladiators facing each other in a bat. And so then like, if you get a advantage on the guy, then, then you're at his side and then you can have dominant position i don't know i'm i've worked all the mechanics out yet but uh it's going to be like a card game where i play a card uh, you know i play a thrust and then you play a block a block or a parry or whatever it's, uh, yeah, there you go yeah and then you've got a different the different role play aspects. aspects well your medic is like if you get a, a a you can increase your strength but only to a certain cap and then you'll have agility and your constitution. It's it's almost right. like Dungeons and Dragons to a degree, right. as right. far as your dudes. But it's in the arena, right? And then you yeah, 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 yeah. You can battle the guys. And, so and, you're almost uh, man you're managing you're managing your team. Yeah, of, of fighting. You're gonna, and, and, you're gonna and fight so three three battles, uh, two prelim rounds, and then the primus, and then, and then in the primus you hold. And the see the thing is, you get a roll for the other guy. You can either play two player or you can role for the primus is going to be the really tough guy right so the so it's a you're rolling on the chart where they're much worse bigger badasses than just the normal uh, role that you have to make so anyway there's there's a lot that could be done with it i i think it would be fun it would be and you'd have decisions to make on which uh gladiators to buy at market right and then you have right. to train them and decide how to do that Oh yeah, absolutely, Mo. Come on, brother. <laughs> Put yeah, your denarii down on your boy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and so, I, so uh, I think that's uh, definitely have to have that in. So anyway, I don't know. I'm gonna call it blood and sand. I think. Um, well, I, I just think it'll be fun. I've never really done anything with swords before, so. Uh, there you go. Good money. Money. There we go. Well, all right. <laughs> all right. Well, Fred, I tell you what, Fred, you have given me the motivation I need to start work on it in earnest. So, all right. so I've been so talking when, about doing it, but you know, yeah. I need new game design. Requests. When does it go? Oh, when does it go to P five hundred then? Yeah. <laughs> Where's my game? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, the uh, um, fortunately, Compass. You know, I'm. 
I am truly blessed though. I have I no complaints because of like when I, I say to Bill, I want to do this game. And he says, okay. <laughs> well, so you, you're lucky like that because you, now, 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 you're a player now, right? So you're, 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 yeah. you're, you're a commodity, right? You've, uh, yeah. you're, proof, you're proven. So uh, you, you, there is, there is something to have a track record. Yeah. You're, you're, so, you're, you're the Richard Berger of Compass Games, except you're not a dick, right? So. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the Got thing is, I, I, I'm like a I'm like a card designer, and I I have not created my Edsel yet. So you know, I'm 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 blessed. I have no complaints. Right. I no, I I've had a few hits, so that's yes, it does open doors for me, uh, and so I'm lucky because I if I get a wild hair and I say I want to do a gladiator game, Bill's not going to tell me no. I actually haven't asked him yet, but I, I'll. I'm pretty sure he'll I'll get the nod, you know, and that's the cool thing because Compass doesn't have this P500. They, yeah, they're willing to accept risk uh, right. on on titles, and so I'm applaud them for that. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, for the uh, for the gladiator, the gladiator game, yeah, it's like, yeah, it's like a thing. <laughs> the, the pro. I tell you, the problem I'm having right now is I'm 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 like. I'm like the heavy guy that's clogged up the toilet for Compass. I mean, I, I can. You've got a lot of games coming out. I do, and the thing is, he's only Bill's only putting out two a month, which I don't. Nobody wants to see any game company travel the route of SPI, right? right. Which is, you know, crash. You know, you don't want to see that going on. So, I mean, I don't blame him for just doing two two a month. That's cool. Uh, but I'm only one of dozens of dozens of designers for companies, so I have to fight for for release. Yeah. I'm like, please release my. Oh, okay, great example. Uh, Imperial Tide, my World War One game, which is just like Pacific Tide. It's card game, two player. Yeah, yeah. all of World War One. That's been ready since May. Wow, it's not getting released until December. Not because it wasn't done. Because right. there was no room on the production track. Well, you know, I got Western Front Ace. I got an American Tank Ace. Just got to the printers. Uh, I'm working on this sucker now. Um, you know, it's it's really not a question of can I make it before 2024. I can probably have the Gladiator game done before the end of this year. Right. And the problem is getting it on the production release yeah. track. So, and you've got uh, you've got Atlantic Sentinel coming as well, right? Yeah, that's actually that's the tester. I'm this is the first game I've had in a long while. The testers have just been crazy about it, <laughs> uh, so I'm really happy about that. But it's it's the opposite of the hunters, which and again, what's the genesis of this design? Well, people have been bugging me for six, seven, eight years. Do a game. I want to be the flower class Corvette. I want to be a right. destroyer. I want to sink the U boats. You know, I want right, to right, 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 right. So this is fine. And I couldn't figure out how to do it. And the the answer is I had to break the engine. Um. Remember at the start, I said, you know, I always you're always in charge of one weapon system, mm -hmm. and that's the focus. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, John. I appreciate that. Well, uh, yeah, I, I do like the multitask, but uh, but I had to break the engine. So I didn't do this game for five, six years, even though I've been asked for many times because, you know, I have that – my engine is that you're in charge of a single weapon, and I, I couldn't see that being in charge of a single destroyer just didn't make sense as far as the convoy escort. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, okay. So you're in charge of an entire escort group. And so you've got like two destroyers, four Corvettes, those six, seven ships, and you're escorting the convoy across and, and it works. But the best part is, is you can match it up with the hunters. No. Yes. The combat uh, is singular. So, so would it still be like two solitaire games or would it be opposed then? How does that, what's, how's that going to work? 
Yeah, no, 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 no. Well, either way. Um, <laughs> You're so excited. It's great. <laughs> yeah. So, well, this is what made this is once I once I broke the code on. Oh, you need to the the thing that makes sense is an escort group. That's what the six seven escorts. That's what escorted the convoys across. Yep. Okay, you're in charge of that. Makes sense. And then I said, well, how can I do the combat? I thought, well, crap. I know the hunter's combat system works. We'll do that. The U-boats come in. The oh, AI. Right, 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 right. So if you get a wolf pack attacking you, the AI controls the U-boats, randomly places them. You have already placed your escorts, hopefully. Right. And then you use the, the the most of them. use the hunter's combat resolution system. Yeah. It's ding, ding, ding. Yeah. So that's right. how you do it. Now, what that means is, is that if you play this two player, you can have a hunter's player. If he's got a copy of the hunters, he can bring in his type C. And then when you roll for, oh, I've got a U-boat, he comes in and fights you. Or mm -hmm. I roll for a wolf pack. He's one of the seven boats in the wolf pack that attacks you. So the, the games uh, like seamlessly integrate. I was like, oh man, this is so cool. Oh, well, so, so, uh, imagine being at a con and then you if you get a wolf pack, you could have five or six guys. Yes, you, yes, right? Right? That. Exactly. Yeah. That's, so you know, and, and so that really made it for me. And but the other thing that's that's cool is it actually works as a standalone game mm -hmm. with that hunter's combat system, works perfectly. It's great, and you've got Plus, you've got all these hundreds of, of ships in the convoy you roll for, just like the hunters. So it's a lot of replayability. No two things are the same. I've got the condor, Focky Wolf condors coming in, spotting you. Uh, yes, I. sorry, Fred. I, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but but Fred, look at the look at the bright side, brother. When I get my check from Compass, you know, I will... I will take my share that came from you and I will buy myself a, a big beer. <laughs> there we go. There we go. It'll, it'll and go I will drink it in your honor, Fred. I'll, tell you what, I will, I'll try to remember that. But yeah, so that's, it's uh, uh, Atlantic Sentinels, I think is, is it's going to be good. It's, it's good already. The testers are like, they're loving it. I this, you know, it's, um, it, it's a little tricky though. It's only 42, 43. I kind of tried to pick the sweet spot of the mm -hmm. U-boat war, you know, because if I, before. It was terrible. Yeah. It was just, yeah, it'd be horrible for the play. It wouldn't be much fun. Yeah. And after, you know, after mid 43, it's just a, you, you slaughter the U-boat. Right. So it's that, a, it's I, a I, shooting that yeah. I picked the, yeah, the section that is, contested shall we say so it's it gives you the greatest challenge and it's fun and you have assets but um you know i got type 271 radar and the and you um a lot of different uh, things you can do it's kind of neat that the thing that's neat about it i think again we talk about decisions you have unlike some of my games which maybe are a little lighter in the decisions i i first admit okay fine you have got a ton of decisions in this one because you've got to array your escorts around the convoy to mm. protect the convoy. And, um, and, and uh, that's one thing. And then decide who's going to respond to which U-boat coming in and what have you. And, and you have to decide wh where you're going to put your 271 radars because they can only cover half. By the way, the other thing that's really crazy, I never knew. I don't know if you knew this. As convoys got bigger, so most convoys at this time frame were either forty or sixty ships, roughly, give or take, you know, half a dozen. Um, as convoys got bigger, I always thought they got longer. They didn't. They got wider. Wider. Ah, interesting. Because they want that travel, the amount of time that they're traveling. In the, the same water, right, right. They want it to be. They want to get. They want that to be narrow to get past the U-boat danger. So they actually got wider. I never knew that. They got up. They they were about eight ships, eight ships deep, and then as many 
multiples of eight is just more columns to the convoy. So they mm. got wider and wider and wider. I, I was like, wow, yeah, that's how did I never realized that before. I, why did it take me 60 years to figure that out? Yeah, I didn't know that. Uh, so so you, yeah, uh, kind of cool, huh? So anyway, I got, well, yeah, speaking of research, I got some uh, killer books. Um, one showing how they arrayed their defenses and the different things they did hmm. and the results do, of the convoys. Do you add that into your, um, I'm sorry. Design, does, do you add that into your designer notes and stuff like that? So when you, oh, use, absolutely. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I take that part very seriously that every game that I've ever released in the back has a pre reasonably extensive bibliography. Right. And, uh, and I also put in a, it, usually about a page, sometimes longer designer notes. So I explain some of the processes of what went on. Premises, yeah, yeah, cool, cool. <laughs> okay. You know, I, I, I believe it or not, uh, John, I, I get beat up about this quite a bit. It's like, you're an army guy. What the hell are you doing with all these submarine games? Uh, well, uh, uh, number one reason was the army paid my uh, college. Um, and then I got to repay the army with four years. So that's kind of why I went into the army because they were kind of kind enough to offer me a scholarship. Um, yeah, exactly. I hear you, brother. I couldn't believe that. Well, I, I, um, they just in Pennsylvania, they just the liquor stores just went uh, restricted of having supply chain issues. I, wow. So they restricted I, I, like uh, 20, 30 types of booze. You can only I'm, buy I'm one sorry. bottle or something. I'm sorry. We're, you know, supply chain issues. I, I don't know if it's related to all these people getting more money from sitting home on their asses and, and drawing these big unemployment things. But let's not get into politics. But I, it's, I don't know what it's related to. But it's not the only first time I've seen, uh, personally seen supply chain issues with uh, Gatorade, of all things. Can't buy Gatorade anymore. They really? put up a sign in the store, supply chain issues. I'm like, what yeah. the fuck? Anyway. Um, yeah, I, I get a lot of grief for being an army guy, and I've done all these uh, navy games, <laughs> but the air games, right? Well, the the short answer is because you know I know army stuff. I was on active duty for 28, 20 years, twenty eight years total career length. I mean, you know, I know army stuff. I like to get excited about the game I'm doing. And so I like when I get excited, when I do historical research, that's sort of where I, you know, Maslow's hierarchy and needs. That's where I'm self-actualizing. I'm like yeah, yeah, learning yeah. all this kind of cool stuff I never knew before. Right. Well, so I, I like to, I like to do research. It's just, I love it. It's that's what's fun for me. Right. And so that's why, you know, I do these Navy games because I'm learning about stuff I didn't know about before. Right. And, you know, plus the Army side was a little personal for me. You know, I mean, I, I did have two tours in, in Iraq. I, I did finally do my first tank game. The American Tank Ace is basically uh, Patton's Best remake. I hate to say that, but it's more, sort of kind of more or less. So uh, it's Patton's Best in my style. Okay. Uh, that's cool. So I did finally do a do an army game. So there you go. You know, why didn't I go navy? Well, it's just the way it was. Anyway, um, I'm sorry to babble. I I told you you're gonna. You yeah, know, you were right. You were right. You're a good. Talker. I'm not gonna freeze up on you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love it. Well, so you know, I think uh, we have a similar sort of passion in that the games that I purchase tend to foster me buying books or I buy a book and then I want to need a game on the topic. And so that's what drives exactly. my little interest. And then somewhere along the way, I just started taking pictures of what I was doing. And you know, time, it's, and, and know and you, right? I absolutely, you, you, you read that killer book and you're like, Oh man, I need to do a game. I need to do a game on this topic. So yeah, I, I, I can relate to that yeah. completely. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, and that's you know the point is, I think a, I think a game's a failure if it doesn't teach somebody a little something about the history right. of what's right. going on. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, unless it's you know Axis and Allies or Risk or something. Okay, fine. You don't you don't need to learn history for that. But right. you know, a legitimate war game. If you're not learning a little history, then I I say that game is a failure in my mind. 
Yeah, and so, and so Mo and I were playing a game last night. It was Bug River, and not to get on. Oh, get out of town. Are you now face-to-face or computer? Uh, computer. We did computer, yeah. Uh, I was going to say, because I know Mo's in Texas, too. Yeah, he's in Dallas. We're not that far apart, but it's three hours, so, you know. It, uh, I, I, yeah, I, far, I like far enough. Okay. <laughs> it's not, I don't like him that much. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, I think, you know, I, I think we, as we're playing, I'm thinking – I'm not sure this is what went on. <laughs> right? And it's not that it's the game's bad per se. I just don't know. I've got to go now pull the book out and go work out, well, what sure. really went on? How long did it take to do what these guys actually did? It's 41, trying to get across the Bug River, and the Germans are, I think at least I think it's 41. I can't remember now. But what, whatever it is. So it's, it, it's Army Group South, I think. Is that right? Army, Army Group Center. Who knows? So, uh, I'm thinking I got to pull a book, so because I want to understand what the sort of the operational tempo was and the things that happened. Because what we're seeing is uh, kind of slow and cluttered, and I'm wondering is it you know poor gameplay by me or the stupid freaking vassal die roller, or is it some other? Is it you know is it a game design mechanic? Is it bad game design? Yeah. Yeah, you know. So who knows, right? So, but the cool thing is, I'm like. Now all my books, I'm in the middle of moving house, but all my books are over at the other house. So it'll be a couple of days, but I want to sit down, pull a couple of books out, do some Googling, and uh, okay, so what, what's going see, on? Right. And and that brings up a really interesting point that a design also I feel strongly. You know, it it the mechanics, you know, you, you have to abstract things. Right. I mean, that's just the way life is. I mean, that's important. But the point is, is it's okay to abstract as long as you get the right feeling when you're playing. So, I I don't know. Panzer Group Guderian is a great example. You know, little cardboard squares is a lot different than running people over with tanks in reality. But the point is, you get the feeling of a swirling uh, engagement. Yes. In, yes. Pan, in in that game, for example, uh, and uh, the hunters, you really get the feeling like you're getting depth charged, like uh, you're right. sweating that die roll. You know the tension ratchets up. So I, if you have a mechanic, it's okay to abstract as long as the mechanic represents the reality, or at least a range of realities. Right. But it gives you that feeling. It gives you the right feeling of what actually occurred right and uh so i think if you can achieve that that's your your you're, you're on the right path then and so and so the, the flip side of, of this particular game uh, is you know i was involved with a vassal session with five or six mm-hmm. of and we were doing a test turn of campaign for north africa and so it was you know all the logistical full full rules the whole sure, sure. and because it's split up across a bunch of guys, it really was actually kind of manageable. And uh, we, but you spent more time dickering with updating your spreadsheet than to to capture stores, water, and ammo utilization than you did thinking about where am I going to move my guys, right? And and why am I moving my guys? And what am I trying to achieve? So uh, it, it just it while it showed you how things functioned and worked in the desert and breakdown rates and trucks and tanks and all so it's like it's all all awesome and you're like wow it was really a cluster right but it didn't enrich the gaming experience that you had exactly you You see that doing a lot of math right well that's you know and they the old adage is uh amateurs talk tactics and uh professionals talk logistics and uh you know I understand the importance of logistics. Uh, you know, I my tank battalion run out of gas, diesel, jet fuel, right. in Iraq when we're about to make contact. Or well, we weren't down to the last few gallons. We were everybody was black status. Right. So I understand the importance of logistics. Trust me, I, there's nothing worse than being almost out of fuel and you're in contact. Uh, but it's it's not fun. You know, we all, everybody plays because they want to be the guy pulling the trigger, basically, you know, popping caps. Uh, But I, it's just that 
good design can minimize logistics. I'll t and I'll tell you, I think the proudest thing I've ever done, really, game design-wise, my best mechanic I think I ever came up with, other than the depth charge loop, was in uh, defending, uh, excuse me, Night Fighter Ace. Has, see, I, I, my original Night Fighter game, paper game, which got locked into John Krantz's garage for 10 years. Great stories. <laughs> I'll tell you, maybe if we ever meet in person. Uh, but I mean, you had to track the fuel hex by hex. It was hideous. It was tedious. It was a horrible game uh, for that reason alone. Now, I don't know if you've ever played a game where you had to track fuel hex by hex by hex. Okay. This is, this is ugly. This is not pretty. This is, yeah. Wow. This is not fun with a capital F. So in Night Fighter Ace, I had this mechanic where I had a grid was cross referenced. So your takeoff field is is on the uh, uh, this axis and your target is on that axis and when the bombers are assigned to bomb Berlin or wherever you cross reference and boom you go there and it automatically burns the correct amount of fuel gotcha right so it's this you know cross reference target to take off now, I could have, in this my design, I mean, I could have had, oh, you have to track fuel hex by hex because that will be more realistic. Well, you know, how realistic does it need to be? This is why we roll dice. A, a right. certain level of abstraction is perfectly acceptable. And so in the design, you have this effortless fuel consumption. I was just so happy with it. I was thrilled. And, uh, I mean, that kind of, you know, yes, logistics are important, but it's just not fun unless you're a logistics guy and you want to learn about logistics. I mean, I know a guy who designed a logistics game and that's all it does. <laughs> he actually did it for the army, but uh, right. yeah, you, you bet it was your fault, brother. Support was <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Hey, I, I was a, I was a combat support company commander. I, at one point in time, I, I, well, I command. I was the XO, but I commanded it for a little while. Uh, yeah, combat support. Ooh. <laughs> we'll look. Yeah, we all we all want to be the guy in the tank. I mean, or or pulling the trigger. So you, we all want to be the guy in the tank, if you, right? If you, if you do it, you can. Some games can overdo logistics to their detriment. I think. Sure. Sure. From the viewpoint of you can I'm make a, rules to account for it and have them be reasonable. Yeah, yeah. I'm a huge OCS fan. I love playing OCS, and I I, I like doing my little logistics efforts there. But I do I kind of do the Kev version of it, so it's it's not 110 percent accurate, you know, gameplay yeah. necessarily. But it's kind of like you know we we know we got enough shit to get from A to B, so we're gonna just say it's there, and I move, yes. I move the trucks, and we we you know we roll back and whatever it all well, works you know, out and see that here's another example american tank ace i just wrapped that finished it okay let's test for kev how many rounds main gun rounds ammunition 75 millimeter ammunition did an m4 sherman carry oh uh, damn so i have no idea but i'll say less than 20. uh that, I'm not even going to say that was a good guess. No, it, 97. 97? That's main gun rounds, okay? Oh, my God. So I'm not even – I thought they had like 20 or 30 rounds. No, no, main gun rounds. Oh, well, and I hear it. No wonder those things blew up. We're called Ronsons. I'm going to turn my air okay. connection on. Hang on one second. This is a, this is a 105. <sighs> Okay, oh, so wow. this, is a, this is a 105 shell. Uh, now, the 75s are going to be about half this big, maybe, roughly, maybe a little smaller than that. 97, yeah. Most of the rounds are carried in the hull. Yeah. Okay, there's like eight rounds in the ready rack, but most of the rounds are stored in the hull of the tank, and you have to spin the turret and move the turret basket and move panels and pull them out, and there's some behind the turret. Anyway, the point is, yeah, 97 rounds. Well, some tanks had 90 uh, M4A1. Anyway, the point is, 
in my tank game, I'm like, I'm not going to make the player track 97 rounds of ammo. That's stupid. Right, right. The most you could ever conceivably fire uh, that I ever fired in testing was like about, I don't know, eight or 10 rounds. So the game tracks special ammunition like white phosphorus, smoke, uh, APCR, the hot rounds, the yeah. armor. But AP, uh, armor piercing and high explosive, no, don't track it. Unlimited. So is that realistic? Oh, no, you might run out. No, you're not ever going to run out. In, yeah, I mean, in you, a 10-minute scenario where you engage three other tanks, right, you're unless, not going to fire 97 freaking rounds. So, right, I was just, just going to say, unless you're fighting an entire battalion of tanks. Oh, wait, there was a movie about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know, it's funny. I, I mean, some of the scenes of Fury are pretty bogus, but the right. most realistic scene I thought in Fury was when they had the four tanks online firing all their machine guns at the same time. You know, if you remember, the German guys were like completely yeah. ducked down in their foxholes. They didn't dare even lift their heads. Right. Or they'd get around through the through their helmet, top of their helmet. That's that is suppression. Yes. When a war game talks about suppressing the target, okay, you saw all those, that is what suppression is like. Um, yeah, a lot of tracers, uh, they're very pretty, but, uh, <laughs> you know, but that's, that's suppression. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, the rest of it was kind of, I mean. Uh, oh, there's just, there's just some goofy ass it's shit. A, yeah, yeah. No, I like and the movie. It's, it's, wrong, it's but, uh, theater, you know. It is. Yeah, I, the, there's yeah. no way that tiger would have just bounced off his uh, wooden logs on the side of his tank. Right. The 88 probably would have gone through the wood log and then through the hull and then through the other side of the hull. Right. right. But that's besides the point. Anyway, um, I mean, it could bounce if the angle was severe enough, but uh, that was a little silly. But um, yeah. point being, you know. 97 rounds you don't you don't have to always track everything as long as it's accounted for uh and so i think that's uh, i think that was a reasonable approach to that role for american right. tank aids and, and it's and it's contextual too right so you know what yeah. are we doing what's the time frame what's the scale yeah, what, it's yeah a, what's the scenario even what's the scenario right so yeah. you know I, I see um in mbt and panza uh, the tactical uh, you know gmt tactical games uh, gym days games uh they're super uber detailed but you um you'll roll a die to see if you have enough ammo for your panzer or your sherman or whatever and if you want to roll a special a spe fire a special round type and i'm thinking okay. Yeah, and I think it's it's mainly for the APCR stuff, but uh, but yeah, that makes it, sense for the APCR. They typically only had two rounds per tank. Of yeah, that. right. So if you don't if you don't get if you don't get a certain roll, then you get a massive modifier going forward trying to use those rounds, right? So it, it basically obviates your ability to use the to use the the round. So you don't, mm -hmm. and then you just go back to the regular AP stuff. So. Uh, Anyway, so it's uh, detail, 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 and then sometimes it works. So, so yeah. Well, I, you know, there's nothing wrong with having a lot of detail as long as it's not painful to Yeah, implement. yeah, yeah. Does that and make often, sense? You know, right. And often, yeah. often it can be detailed. And if you play a game <clears> enough, <throat> you can, you, you get some muscle memory going. So you, you can roll right through all the complexity sure, sure. And, and, just, and just go, Hey, here's, here's the net result. I don't need to look up these 17 DRMs because I know none of them matter. Matter, here's right? my percentile dies. Boom. Yeah. Let's check that first and yeah. then see if it's worthwhile. Doing well, that. again, the elegance, you need to strive for, I feel you need to strive. I try to strive for elegance in the design and that if I have a lot of historical details, to somehow implement it without the player having to dick with it or look it up or whatever, right. if it's built into the charts or built into the combat routines. And so then that helps. But yeah. anyway, well, right. man, we, we've been at it for an hour. Yeah. 40. 
you, Hour 40, you, and we, we discussed nearly all of your games, not just this, not just this guy <laughs> right behind me. So that's pretty cool. So everyone go out and buy all of them <laughs> yeah. now. Yeah, all and then I can afford to take for supper. Well, you know, I sorry, I, I I warned you, man. I've got the gift of blab. My yeah, it's all good. It's all good. I'm I'm let, letting you run because you're fun and interesting. So uh, that yeah, doesn't I mean anyone else who was on wasn't. It. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, well it's a, it's I'm it's been a fun gig. I'm just I'm thrilled that um, I mean it was always my I mean I've been playing these things since I was a teenager. Right. You know, fifty years I've been wargaming, and it was always my dream to you know. Des I mean, I think in our deep in our heart of hearts, everybody's kind of a little bit of a designer because everybody's like. They play their favorite game. They're like, "Well, if I had to design this, I'd I'd have done this, or I'd have done this. that." Right, right. And you see that actually a lot on Board Game Geek. These guys they make their own little modules or add-ons or variants. Yeah. Everybody does that. That's it's in our heart of hearts. We we're gamers. We're historically oriented, and so we love doing it. But it was always my dream, and I'm just. Uh, as we said in Iraq, I'm just living the dream, brother. The dream. <laughs> One day at a time, man. That's it. Cool. I'm, well, I'm, that, I'm happy, you. but I, I appreciate the the chance to babble. I I hope I was I hope I satisfied your requirements. Sir. You 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 babbled effectively, and we and I love it. So uh, we'll look forward to seeing the release of all this stuff. I think uh, I think it's got me uh, fired up to go uh, put a couple of orders in on a few things as well, and maybe uh, try and catch up on some stuff I've missed. So it's, it's been yeah. awesome. Great. Thanks, man. Well, if you need to ask me questions, just bug me anytime. You know All where right. to find me. All right, brother. All right, ciao. Ciao.